Good evening. I'm Tom Kaplan, and as chairman of 92Y Talks, I have the honor of welcoming our community and introducing our esteemed guests this evening. Thank you for joining us for this special 92Y program for two incredibly talented journalists and storytellers. Tonight, we are joined by award-winning American journalist, Sharzad El Ganyan, for an exploration of her new book, Titan of Tehran, a personal chronicle of family, loss, and notions of belonging to a community as a loyal patriot, as well as as a Jew. Through extensive research about her family history, Sharzad tells the story of her grandfather, Habib El Ganyan, a prominent Jewish businessman and philanthropist from Iran and the first civilian executed during the 1979 revolution. It is a most compelling chronicle of a Jewish leader of a community that reached back 2,500 years to the Babylonian captivity. Joining Sharzad in conversation is fellow American journalist, Robert Reed, who has served as a foreign correspondent for the Associated Press in Europe, Asia, and the Middle East for nearly 35 years. Robert has extensive experience reporting from conflict zones, including from the Iranian Revolution, Lebanese Civil War, Bosnian War, and Afghanistan. A US Army veteran himself, Robert currently serves as the senior managing editor of Stars and Stripes. Thank you all so much to our speakers and patrons for being here for what promises to be a wonderful and fascinating discussion about a book everyone should read and for so many, many reasons. Please welcome our esteemed guests to begin the conversation. Good morning. I found this really a fascinating book. And it's a remarkable story on several levels. It's not only the tale of a man who had risen from poverty to become, as the title says, a titan of industry and a leader of Iran's Jewish community. It's also the story of a, of a people who um, had lived in Iran as a community for longer than Christianity and Islam have been in existence. And in the tumultuous days of 1978 and 1979, they found their, uh, um, their homeland ripped from them, it seems. And the, um, as a result, in the wake of uh, El Ganyan's execution, an estimated 75% of Iran's 100,000 Jewish citizens fled their homeland for Israel, the United States, and other safe havens. So this book's not simply an account of one man's life and tragic ending. It's a story of a people and their struggle um, in the beginnings of a tumultuous series of events that are still playing out in the Middle East today. So welcome, Shazad. First, could you tell us a bit about your grandfather, both as a man and as an institution? and what prompted you to write this book? Thank you, Bob. Yes, um, like you said, he was a titan of industry. And um, to put it in, in perspective for our audience, uh, he was uh, among a group of well-known industrialists like Vanderbilt and Carnegie who brought their country into the modern age by helping industrialize and modernize Iran um, beginning in the late 1950s. Um, along with his brothers, they built the first high rise in Tehran, uh, which was the iconic 17th story Plasco building that was in 1962. Um, and that building burnt down in 2017, so not long ago. Um, so the brothers were, were amazing. They introduced the plastic uh, consumer goods to Iran uh, with the largest and most diversified plastics factory in all of the Middle East. And they produced everything from melamine dishes to combs to slippers, toys at nearly every plastic consumer good you can think of. Um, so they were very uh, enterprising and then they expanded to manufacturing uh, larger durable goods like refrigerators and stoves, then aluminum profiles for the construction boom. and uh, Eventually, they were also involved in mining and more real estate projects. So it was a real conglomerate um, and it was very uh, big and diversified for its time. Uh, they also had other ventures and partnerships with Muslims and Armenians. Um, and, uh, aside from 
being a businessman, my grandfather was also the secular leader of the Jewish community. Um, and, and along with that, he was a philanthropist who donated to various causes. Among them were education and, and, uh, and hospitals. Um, and as you mentioned earlier, he was, uh, he was, uh, he was executed on, uh, during the revolution uh, on May 9, 1979. And uh, that was the first time that civilians were executed. Um, it, it was a very sad story. He, he was tried without a lawyer. Um, he was put in front of a firing squad shortly after. And, uh, and it was a big shock to everybody because uh, civilians hadn't been executed until that day. And um, the news was on the front page of the New York Times and other major publications and even on the evening news. Um, Walter Cronkite on CBS and Peter Jennings of ABC both reported on it. And um, to get to the second part of your question, I am um, about why and how I decided to write the book. Uh, so growing up, I knew that he had been killed, killed that way and, uh, and, and because of that, I was always interested in, in human rights. So I worked at Freedom House during and after college. And then later I, I moved on to work in journalism. And um, I always wanted to, to write a book about him. And I finally decided to do it after reading another front page story where his name was mentioned. Um, that was in 2010. And uh, I remember I get an email from my father telling me that his, uh, his father's name was in the paper. So I immediately typed it up and, and I found a story about, um, about a, a computer virus. And you know, back then, that now, now we hear about hackings and, and all sorts of things like that. But in 2010, that was, it, it was kind of like the first one that we, we had really read about. And uh, this computer virus was called Stuxnet, and it was designed to sabotage Iran's nuclear program. Um, in the in the in Stuxnet, in the code, they were looking for uh, any clues to see like where this uh, might have come from. And um, and the researchers found a series of numbers that was embedded in the code. It was at 1979, 05, 09. Uh, so 1975, 05 for May, 09 for the date of his execution. And they, you know, they, they said that it could be a reference to, to that date. And, um, and so the, uh, the, there was this speculation. And, and of course, we don't know. Um, but, that, but reading that article really showed me that he, he still cast a pretty long shadow. And, that, and I realized that, uh, that, you know, he was still important enough to be on the front page of the New York Times. So I would say that Stuxnet was my hook and it was, it was the spark for the book. Yeah, I found that Stuxnet reference quite fascinating. The United States and Israel have never acknowledged anything officially about this operation, but it's widely believed that it was the most sophisticated and successful cyber attack to date a clandestine effort by the two countries to delay the development of an Iranian nuclear bomb without triggering a new Mideast war. And the notion that the date of your grandfather's execution may have been buried in the coding, it struck me that this, this is very much like uh, the old pictures that we used to see of um, um, American GI scratching uh, notes on, the, on bombs destined for Germany or Japan with Phrases like remember Pearl Harbor, or I suppose in this case, this one's for you, Habib. <laughs> it's amazing. In your research, obviously you turn to your parents and your aunts and your uncles, but much of the material obviously came from sources outside the family, um, particularly records and archives in Israel that I didn't realize were, were that open to uh, uh, public research. I wonder if you could tell us about the process of gathering that information, how you synthesized what you heard from aunts and uncles and parents and, and what you saw um, 
you know, in writing from contemporaneous records? Yes, so the research was really the most exciting um, part of the process for me um, because I knew very little about him. Uh, my, my, my knowledge was kind of superficial and, and so, uh, and it was good because I didn't really know him very well. Like I, I wasn't very close to him. We came to America when I was very small. I was only five. Um, and I saw him maybe one, once after that uh, when he was in America. And uh, so my knowledge was superficial and I didn't have any emotional ties besides just knowing that this horrible like, injustice had, had happened to him. So I, I approached my research like a reporter and um, I wanted to write a really great, like, like I was writing an in-depth feature, um, really digging and learning as much as I could about him to rebuild and restore everything that, that had been destroyed when he was killed. Um, uh, so my, you know, my goal was to explain who, who this man was and why his life, his life and death mattered so much and still matter today. Um, so, uh, you know, because he was a public figure that I found a ton of primary sources and, um, that was really invaluable. Oh, one thing that I found that was, uh, amazing was that his brother, uh, Davud, who had written his own diaries and he was very meticulous in keeping um, keeping notes about everything that had happened and, and how the businesses grew. So that was, that was just a, an excellent source to have um, about the businesses. And um, in terms of the primary sources, I found a lot of newspaper articles from Iran, from the United States. And then I had really great chapters in Iranian history books. So I owe a lot to the Iranian historians who have written about him. And also uh, one of my favorite books, and I really recommend it to anybody who wants to understand Iran and what happened before the revolution. It's called The Illusion of Power. And it was written by the Financial Times reporter in Iran at the time. His name is Robert Graham. And this book is, was, is a little treasure. It, um, it has invaluable information about understanding the economic situation. And for me, it was important because you know, my grandfather was a businessman. Um, in addition to that, I relied on a, a FOIA request, which is the Freedom of Information Act. I interviewed American officials, Israeli diplomats he knew, and um, I talked to, this was fascinating, um, the Nazi hunter, Serge Klarsfeld. And um, I can come back to that later. And I also found a, a, tro a trove of amazing documents from the Zionist archives in Jerusalem. Um, and uh, I also found his secret service files that the Shah had, the Shah's government had uh, on him. I found a transcript of his trial, letters that he had sent to my aunt during the revolution. That was extremely moving. Um, and really, I had a lot of insight into his personality from reading those, uh, his own words, and, along with his will, which was written right before um, he died. Uh, he, he was executed. And uh, so I had a lot of fantastic material um, and having his words was was really one of the most like, am amazing things that I that I was able to find. Um, and it was the most exciting part of the process. And I was learning something new all the time. Um, so I had all this material, and I, I decided that uh, I, I needed to layer the book so that there was his life story, there was the story of Iran's Jews, and then the history of uh, Iran itself. And then I enlarged it with um, Iran's relationship with the US and Israel. Um, and I approached it like a journalist. I kept myself mostly out of the narrative. Um, I, I just, you know, I was very small when this happened. So I really wanted to tell his story and and, but there were times when I was uncovering some really fascinating information, like 
some material that I found at the archive and I wanted to share it with my reader how you know how I felt about finding these um, this information and and one of the one of the things that I found at the archives was um, it, there was a secret trick that a man from the World Jewish Congress called Armin Kaplan, a, a Frenchman, had made to Tehran at the time of the right when the revolution was happening, and he was checking in on the Jews to see how they might help um, the Jews if they needed anything, uh, because you know their their situation was precarious and nobody really knew. And uh, they, his letters and his, his, uh, the summary of his fact-finding mission was so meticulously conserved. It included a handwritten note with my grandfather's name on it and his phone number and all the names and phone numbers of the other people that he wanted to, he needed to get in touch with. So it was absolutely touching and, and it was a great journey for me. Yeah, that research must have given you a much more complete understanding of uh, uh, Habib al Ghanai and that as a person and as a public figure than most of us have of our own grandparents or great grandparents, whom we, you know, know only from old photos or re recollections of aging family members. As you gathered this information, did the picture you had of your grandfather or the the myth that always arises, you know, in generations after a major figure in the family dies. Did this um, change in any way? Um, uh, did you find yourself facing some aunt or uncle who said, no, that's not the way it is at all? <laughs> and, um, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about that experience. Sure. So. You know, when I was growing up, and I think this is very common, um, when there's something very uh, like tragic that happens in a family, uh, you know, no, people like we didn't really talk about it all that much. Um, and like I said, I was five when we left, and, and seven when he was executed. So um, I was really learning the things from the history books and newspaper articles. And um, and I, I was surprised by certain things that I, I didn't know. Like I didn't know that um, they lived in a, in a segregated Jewish ghetto. I didn't know how, how poor he was. Um, and um, in, in terms of what I was finding out from family, I was mostly interviewing them and and you know, it was very like formal and, and pretty serious. So I would go and, and meet somebody and say, you know, I, I have questions and I'm I just need to interview you. So I would I would ask questions. Um and uh and I, I'm sure you know they were they like nobody knew the full story because it's just so big. And uh, and some of it was getting lost in the midst of history, and and so I knew that my my mission was really important because I was gathering information from everybody and I was going to piece it together. Um, it, was, it was really therapeutic because it, everything was becoming very clear. I was laying it down and I, I wanted to layer it. And, um, and I knew that I was gonna get a complete picture of him. And, and what was fascinating is that not only I got a better picture of him, but I learned a lot about who I am, um, about where I come from and what it means to be, you know, Jewish or what it means to be from Iran. And, uh, and it helped me also to understand like how I, how, how I identify as a, as a person, as a journalist, as a woman. Uh, and, and, uh, the, the most fascinating part is that you know, I I learned a lot about how much anti-Semitism there was in, in Iran and um, the, the, the part about living in the ghetto was really very eye-opening. Um, apparently they, uh, so what was happening is that they, they lived in segregated ghettos because they were considered dirty and they, they also, they, they didn't want to, um, 
to convert to Islam. So they so they segregated in these ghettos, and um, and and they were very poor, but they were very resilient. Um, so uh, this anti-Semitism was around before the Islamic Revolution. I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit on the, the history of anti-Semitism in Iran. It, um, the community had been around for so many centuries. I mean, there are books in the Bible that were written in the Old Testament that were probably written in Persia. Um, and yet this anti-Semitism um, still persisted. And the idea that the development of anti-Semitism in, in Iran was somewhat different from the way it developed in Europe, for example. Similarities, but there were differences. Right. So in, in Europe, the Jew, Jews were forcibly living in, in ghettos. But in, in Iran, the Jews, they voluntarily congregated into these ghettos so, so that they could they could resist converting to Islam. Um, uh, it, so in the 16th century, there was a, um, the Safavid dynasty um, was when the Shiism was, uh, was uh, established as Iran's official um, religion and the, and the scholars there wanted to convert all the religious minorities. So it wasn't just for Jews, it was for all the, all the religious minorities. And they passed these oppressive decrees to prevent them from prospering. So, um, uh, you know, if you didn't accept Muhammad as the as the prophet, then you were deemed impure, like religiously impure. Um, and they were forbidden from a, a, a bunch of things that um, uh, were really sad. It was so you can list them. They couldn't use Muslim public baths. They couldn't drink from public fountains. They couldn't leave their house when it rained or snowed. Um, they couldn't touch anything when they entered a Muslim shop. Um, they couldn't build homes that were taller than Muslims and they couldn't um, buy homes from Muslims and they couldn't give their children Muslim names. So, so you, you, it's easy to understand why they were, you know, living in their own segregated neighborhood could help them circumvent all of these restrictions. Uh, and I'm sure when you hear some of these, uh, this list, um, you know, it, it reminds us of, of, you know, America and this, and what was happening here much later, um, and the civil rights movement that was trying to change all that. Um, so in Iran, there was a, a constitutional revolution that changed all of that. And um, and that was in in 1905, and you know it, it was on paper because, uh, you know, you still had to change the hearts and minds of people. But anyway, my grandfather was born in a very sweet spot of uh, Iranian Jewish history, and uh, so it was called the golden era, and that's when um, things really got were really good for for the Jewish community. And, um, you know, he, he grew up poor because so he was born in 1912 and 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 uh, they were still living in the in the in the Jewish neighborhood um, because, you know, it takes time to move and uh, and, uh, and change your attitudes. So um, they they finally left the neighborhood in the 20s when Reza Shah, who was the first king of the Pahlavi dynasty, took over. And. Um, Reza Shah wanted to unite all of Iran because there were lots of tribes and ethnic groups and minorities. And, um, and so th that was good for, for um, the Jews and, and all, all the minorities because then they, they had to uh, serve in the military and, and really become, you know, pledge allegiance to, to this new nation that, that Reza Shah was building. And then when his son became uh, the king after the war, World War II, um, he wanted to continue to modernize Iran, and he had uh, something called the, the White Revolution. And uh, but so as things were getting better, um, there there was still the the 
some members of the clergy, including Khomeini himself, who was against um, some of these moves, and he was blaming this uh, westernization in, on, on Israel. And um, one of the things that I found that was, when I first read it, I was shocked, but then it all, of course, it, it made sense, um, that all the way back in 1964, he, uh, he, he was explaining how, how to uh, combat all these changes from the white revolution. And, uh, you know, he was saying that the objective is Islam, that the, it's the country's independence, and it's the prescription of Israel's agents, the unification of Muslim countries. Um, and so he said that most of the major factories and enterprises are run by them. And, um, and so there was a footnote, and in the footnote I saw that uh, my the Algerian family name was in there, and it says that they were among the me mediators of world Zionism. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, that was in the 60s, and the Shah sent Khomeini to exile, but he had, so while things were getting better for Jews, he, he was, uh, you know, he was, he was against the modernization and he was blaming it on, on, on Israel and, and, uh, and saying that people like my grandfather were actually agents of Israel. He didn't consider them Iranian. Um, just that old, uh, the dual allegiance um, thing. Then, so that was, uh, that was in the 60s. And, uh, and there was more anti-Semitism, like more cases that, but in 1975, inflation was very rampant in, in Iran because the Shah was modernizing the country too, too quickly. And uh, to divert attention from, from his own government's ineptitude, to cool down the, the economy, he came up with a campaign. And, uh, and, and it's, it's surprising to me that he, he, he did this because, you know, all along he was very supportive of all the changes and that, you know, that came from people like, including my grandfather. And he came up with a campaign to punish businessmen involved in making consumer goods. So the Secret Service came to my grandfather's home in the middle of the night and he was the first guy that they targeted um and and the next morning the newspaper article said that he was arrested for price gouging and of course it was completely false everyone knew it um the the financial times reporter who was there at the time said that you know it was a really crude effort to brand like the, the entrepreneur um as, as the culprit of these high prices and uh, and the fact that you know the, the bigger names were were people like my grandfather um, was was notable because you know he was Jewish. Um, but that wasn't that wasn't all. Uh, so when I was researching the book, I came across my grandfather's Secret Service files, and these were the files that were, that were written by the Shah's. Uh, the Shah's men, and uh, and they, what they were were, were they were record they were um, writing about his trips to Israel. So my grandfather was the leader of the Jewish community. He also built a, a tall building there, and so he would he would travel there. But they were keeping tabs on those trips. Um, and you know why why keeping tabs only on those trips? and not what he's doing in, in Iran itself. So then those files fell into the wrong hands and, uh, and it was used against him during his trial. Um, and of course that made the rest of the Jews nervous because so many I mean, had traveled to Israel during the Shah's reign. Uh, yeah, I could go on. Um, one more very notable, uh, uh, point to make about the, the anti-Semitism in Iran during the revolution is that after his execution, there was a group of Jewish leaders who went to visit Khomeini. And uh, 
you know, they were doing this to make sure the rest of the Jewish community wasn't in danger because they, they were they were all scared. They had all traveled to Israel, or many of them had at least. It wasn't illegal. Um, and um, and what happened is that Khomeini, you know, said, well, you know, they're the the Zionists, and then they're the, you know, the the Jews. Um, and so it's like the the Zionists are the bad Jews and the and the Jews who are just practicing their religion are the good Jews. And uh, and again, that it's that notion of the dual allegiances, it's uh it's a, a trope that should send off alarm bells for any Jew anywhere in the world. Um you know, which brings us to where, where, where do we belong um, when we hear these accusations. Um, and uh, yeah, so there was a series of these, uh, of these big, big moments that where I was learning about what, uh, you know, what kind, what kind of country, what kind of place I, I come from. Yeah, I can remember um, in Tehran up until almost the end, there was um, a de facto Israeli embassy in, in Tehran. Um, I think it was known as a trade mission or something like this, but it was for all intents and purposes, a full embassy. And I remember uh, one of the highlights of that day was walking uh, down the street past what had been the embassy and just seeing Everything had been looted, the mob had gone in and emptied uh, desk drawers, papers, there were personal photos on the ground, all sorts of stuff. And it, obviously, uh, um, the sensitivities that they had toward the state of Israel um, within the revolutionary movement was, was acute. I think um, also one must remember that <clears throat> as soon as the Khomeini uh, faction seized power on the uh, 11th of February. About three days later, the first foreign visitor showed up in uh, Tehran. It was Yasser Arafat. That's right. I think one of the first questions that comes to mind with readers of the book is that, why didn't he leave? Um, Habib was given many warnings that he should leave Iran. And he had plenty of chances to, to escape even down at the last minute when a uh, senior Israeli official offered him a seat on a plane, no money, no passport required, just show up and we'll fly you out. And he declined. Did he genuinely believe that his contribution to the development of the country would be taken seriously and in consideration by the revolutionaries? Or, or what do you think was the reason that your grandfather chose to stay? So that's the million dollar question. And uh, it's very interesting. Um, so I had a lot of time to think about it while I was writing the book, um, but I was thinking about it again um, in the context of what's happening in Ukraine. Um, and, and I think that that can help understand a little bit better. Um, so in, in Ukraine, we had images of Ukrainians fleeing on the one hand, and um, but there were but there's so many stories of the of people who decided to stay. And um, so each of us has to think like, what would we do if we were in my grandfather's situation? Um, and I have to say, like my first instinct, uh, if something was happening here in America, my first instinct wouldn't be to flee either. Uh, and, and, you know, when you think of all the journalists, um, even like yourself, you who fly into a country to cover a war, you, you know, there's a risk. You don't, you don't watch events, especially big ones and tragic ones, like the wars that you've uh, covered and you don't watch them unfold in the safety of your, your own home or your own country. And, and I guess he was like that. He wanted to be where the action was and you know, where the factories were, where his workers were, where the Jewish community was. Um, he just wasn't gonna run away. I think to him, it may have felt like it was running away. And um, 
I don't know, maybe he and I are, are just cut from the same cloth. I, I, I would, I'm not sure that I would have left. So, but, but to get to the nitty gritty of his life situation, there were other reasons probably. Um, you know, the Shah had imprisoned him once and uh, he was scapegoated for, for Iran's economic problems. So maybe he thought the revolutionaries would see that and see that he wasn't, you know, he didn't have any special um, treatment by the Shah. Uh, and, uh, and then my grandmother had died just the year before. So you'd have to ultimately re redo his life alone. And, um, and, you know, we weren't all in America. So my aunt, his daughter was still there and another son was still there. And, um, and uh, you know, we have to remember that we didn't know at the time that Khomeini would, uh, would replace the Shah. There were a lot of secular forces at the time um, who were vying for change in Iran. And, um, and Iran was his country. He was patriotic. Um, everything he had was there. Um, he didn't have anything outside of Iran. Uh, and he just felt very Iranian, just as much as he felt Jewish. And, um, and he, part of it was also his personality. He was a hopeful, he was just a hopeful guy. He would fall and get back up. And, and he had a big sense of responsibility for the Jews and and his factories and everything that they had spent, spent a whole lifetime building. So when you think of all the reasons, I, I think it makes sense. Yeah, I don't think um, pessimists make good entrepreneurs. I mean, every time you build a factory, take out a loan, uh, do anything, there's always the possibility that this is going to fall apart. And just like a, a prudent gambler, if there are such people, you have to figure on, you know, can I afford to lose this and still push on? And if I can, then perhaps things won't turn out to be, uh, you know, be very uh, dangerous or as dangerous as it, as it seems. And quite frankly, in almost every situation that I've seen anyway, the turbulence always looks worse abroad than it looks at the scene for some reason. And he may have, um, have genuinely felt that, um, um, that things weren't that bad. And on that note, I'd like to add a personal comment. You said that, I think, we didn't know at the time that Khomeini would eventually replace the Shah. Yeah. Now, you know, 43 years later, with the wisdom of hindsight, that comment might seem kind of strange um, because, you know, in, in reading history, one tends to think that after a certain point in 1977 or 78, that Khomeini's rise to power uh, seemed inevitable, but on the ground, it did not. The, you know, the, the fact that the Shah's days were numbered seemed, uh, um, seemed pretty obvious, but that Khomeini would become the, you know, the de facto new Shah? No. That anti-Shah movement at the time was made up of a disparate collection of, of groups, um, <clears throat> not just loyalists uh, to Khomeini, but also communists, Francophile liberals, followers of Dr. Ali Shariati's Islamic socialism, which was the rage among the educated classes and others. Um, the main opposition group, the National Council of Resistance Iran, actually was allied with Khomeini initially. Um, and I think they thought they were going to assume power. That there had been a, a tradition in, um, in Shiaism for Ayatollahs to maintain a you know, strong influence, but an influence from behind the scenes not running the place in any kind of administrative uh, method. So I, I can very well appreciate that uh, perhaps he, like many other Iranians, thought that after it was all over, that Khomeini would retire to Gom and play at the most a behind the scenes role in the affairs of the country. Um, so moving on though, your, father, your grandfather lived in a period of great change in Iran. We, we think now we're in a period of great change in this country, but 
My goodness. I mean, he was born in the final years of a dynasty that had ruled since the 18th century. That dynasty, the Qajars, was overthrown by Reza Khan Pahlavi, uh, who at the time, I believe, was a general and commander of the Cossack Brigade. Um, I mean, he chose, as other um, military leaders in the Middle East did, to um, to follow the example of Ataturk in Turkey, to um, bring Iran into his definition of the 20th century. So Reza Khan then was overthrown in World War II by the British and the Soviets. I found it amazing that the Soviets facing a life and death uh, threat by Hitler would spare troops to involve themselves in Iranian politics. But that brought to uh, power his son, uh, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, who in the West, we simply know as the Shah, who in turn was overthrown by the revolution that did install Khomeini. Um, how do you feel those, uh, each stage of, of that development, national development, shaped your grandfather's life, both for the good and for the bad? You alluded to that a bit, saying he was born in the, in the golden age, but um, despite the fact that the whole experience ended quite tragically for him, it gave him advantages that other people of his religion and his age wouldn't have had in a previous uh, incarnation. That's right. So when Reza Shah came to power in the 20s, um, you know, Jews got a, a chance to prosper and participate in the economy for the first time. And, uh, and I think, you know, having the conscription and everybody, uh, all the men uh, doing their military service was important. It really like taught them to have allegiance to the ruler and, and the nation. And then uh, when he forbid women from wearing the veil uh, to modernize Iran, my, my grandfather who was a good businessman, um, already pretty young, he knew that a lot of women wouldn't, would still wouldn't go out without their hair covered because his, his mother still covered her hair. And uh, so he opened a small shop in the bazaar and he started to sell hats. And uh, that was a great, uh, that was great for him because he was in the, in the bazaar and that's where most of the big Muslim businessmen were all, were there. So he was building a network and, and then, um, then during the, the, the war, they, there was a lot of, there were huge shortages in Iran and they were uh, during the second world war. And so they were importing a lot of goods and, and that's when they, they made, they, they became millionaires was early or like during World War II. And then um, after that, as I mentioned, the, the Shah was, the son was modernizing the country further. And, uh, and that's when they were, they opened the plastics factories and they expanded and were producing all the consumer goods and then the building boom, the building construction. Um, and, and so they were a big part of, uh, in, you know, they went from importing goods to manufacturing. And, uh, and that was just very, very uh, important. Uh, and, um, and also one very interesting thing was that, uh, you know, Jews weren't allowed to have homes that were taller than Muslims. And then suddenly in 1962, you know, the Elganian brothers built the tallest building of its time in Iran. And, um, and that's again, where we see the, the clash between what they were able to do and how, how like they were, they were maybe frowned upon a little. Um, and, um, and so, yes, during the Shah's uh, period, it, it was, they were they were doing really well, and then things began to devolve in the in 1975, as I told you. I found it interesting that um, you know during this period when the Iranian Jewish community needed international support, it was the French community really that stepped forward and took the leading role, maybe rather than the British or the Americans whose countries were also deeply involved in Iranian politics and the economy. I wonder if you could talk about that a little and maybe give some examples of the role that the French Jewish community in France played in, in this transition between uh, um, 
between the monarchical regime and then the, the current uh, situation? Definitely. Um, so I, I went to a French school and uh, when I was growing up, uh, people always asked me why I went to a French school. And uh, it was during the course of my research that I really understood what had happened here. Uh, French Jews were always looking out for us. And, um, and the first person who really contributed to this was a, a French lawyer and politician uh, named Adolphe Crémieux. Um, he, so he was a French Jew and uh, French Jews had, had received their, you know, their equal rights during the French Revolution. And uh, Adolf Kremier was looking out for other Jews around the world. And um, he, he started a, a, an organization called the Alliance Israelite Universelle. And um, he was advocating to push to, to, push to open schools in, in, uh, in various countries, including in Iran, um, in, in the segregated get ghettos so that they could have a good education. And um, this was extremely, extremely important for the success of, of Jews in Iran to have these, um, these schools. And, um, and so my grandfather benefited from this. Uh, then, uh, and, and, and it's huge. Uh, and, and so many generations after, well, three gener two generations after went to French schools. Um, then in, uh, in 1978, I, I, I mentioned this uh, fact-finding mission to Tehran. It was by uh, also a Frenchman named Armand, uh, Armand Kaplan. And uh, he had come to evaluate the situation and meet with um, Iran's Jews to come up with a plan for them in case there was a real danger. And uh, that's, he also met my grandfather there. And, uh, and uh, so that was the second time, and it's very touching that that they would go and really like look out for them. And, and then uh, again, uh, right after my grandfather's uh, execution, the uh, Nazi hunter Serge Klarsfeld flew immediately to Tehran to meet with officials to find out what, what was happening. Like what, what's happening here? Are you, is this going to be the fate of all the Jews of, of Iran? So, so yes, the, the French Jews were always looking out for us and it's, it's really beautiful. On the other hand, some international efforts on behalf of the Jewish community backfired. And so as we're approaching the end of our time, I wonder if you could talk about that. I'm thinking specifically of the Javits resolution that was passed by the Senate uh, in response to your grandfather's execution and a feeling, at least in the some quarters of the American uh, diplomatic community, whether that perhaps was counterproductive. That's right. Uh, the Republican senator from New York, Jacob Javits, passed a resolution uh, to condemn uh, executions of civilians. And, and it happened uh, right after my grandfather was executed. And, um, and this, this completely uh, infuriated Khomeini. Uh, he was saying that uh, America was interfering in, in uh, Iran's uh, internal affairs. He was expecting that the world should be silent, I guess, when innocent people are put in front of firing squads. Um, but, but this resolution uh, was really, then he used it as an excuse to cut off relations with the U.S. and, uh, and not accept the next U.S. ambassador to Iran. Um, and and the, the 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 you know the people who were working in the State Department were really frustrated also because they it created a lot of headaches for them. Um, the uh, on May twenty five there were demonstrators outside the embassy and they had effigies of of, of Carter but also of Menachem Begin the the. Um, the the Egyptian president who had uh, you know who was close to Israel, and they also uh, they were they were saying death to death to the American Senate, and um, th there was also a a caricature of my grandfather. So um, they were it, it was creating a lot of headaches for them, and um, I actually contacted them. 
because I wanted to, to understand a little bit better their, you know, what they were going through and their, their, their perspective. And, um, you know, uh, one of them, uh, Charles Nass, he said that he was the charge d'affaires. So he was in, 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 um, in Iran. And then there was Henry, Henry Prescht, who was the State Department in charge of Iran. And, um, you know, one of them said that, that, that it was complete chaos and that, you know, in hindsight, it might have been better to just shut down the embassy, but there were the cold, it was the Cold War and Iran was really important for them. So they were trying to keep some kind of relationship with, um, with Iran and, uh, and the fact that the Khomeini used this as an excuse to not uh, meet with the next ambassador and there was no ambassador after that really like was a was a problem for them um so it, it had undermined what they had done to keep relations um but at the same time you don't you don't stay silent in you know when things like that happen and anyway i i feel like how many would have found another another excuse um and uh yeah, and, and so that's that's a, the other long, you know, shadow that my grandfather casts is that 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 resolution and and speaking up against his execution um, really and you know ended relations with um, with the United States diplomatic relationships. I think diplomats often tend to look at uh, at the known players, and they knew that there were some people, particularly. Uh, Ibrahim Yazdi, who were trying to salvage a relationship That's with right. the United States. But um, we can only recall that months after uh, your grandfather's execution, the uh, students seized the American embassy and held it, uh, you know, through the end of the Carter administration, certainly. Um, Yazdi had written afterwards that when he heard that it had been seized, he jumped in his car and rushed to Gone to try to get Khomeini to issue a statement um, distancing himself from this effort. And while en route, he heard on the radio that Khomeini had actually endorsed it to take over the embassy. So as you said, there were a lot of different players. And even if, uh, if it hadn't been for the Javits resolution, these other players probably would have forced something either uh, to take over the embassy or some other provocation to have derailed that. Thank you very much for your time, Shazad. And as I said, I really found this a, a fascinating book. Um, I enjoyed it. I would recommend it to anyone who asks. Thank you. Thank you.